Thank you for joining us once again. I'm Ed Shikata, City Manager with the City of Palo Alto in California. It's really my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual author conversation with Richard Rostein, the author of The Color of Law. Before we begin, I would like to extend my warm thanks to Stanford University's Bill Lane Center for the American West for funding this joint program. This event is just one of many ongoing partnerships between the Lane Center and the City of Palo Alto and the City of Palo Alto's Palo Alto Library. I would first like to introduce and thank Ralph Richard Banks for facilitating tonight's event. We are delighted to have Professor Banks as our moderator. Professor Banks is the Reynolds Professor of Law at Stanford University. He is also the founder and faculty director of the recently created Stanford Center for Racial Justice. He is currently working on a book entitled the Miseducation of America about Higher Education and Inequality. Thank you for moderating tonight's event, Rick. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn the program to our keynote speaker, Richard Rothstein, who will present his book for about 40 minutes, about 7.45 or so local time. Then Professor Banks will moderate audience Q&A from 7.45 until our program closes at 8.30 p.m. Tonight's program will be re recorded for future viewing. Okay, with that, here we go. Well Thank you. Um, but let me begin by uh, saying something that uh, most of us know about. Uh, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It uh, began by challenging, actually, uh, segregation in law schools. Uh, it then went on to challenge segregation, litigators challenged segregation in colleges and universities generally. And in 1954, uh, challenged the segregation, legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. That, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 then gave impetus, stimulus, inspiration to a civil rights movement of activism, marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives in that struggle. <coughs> but by the end of the 1960s, we succeeded in persuading most of the country, not everybody, that racial segregation was wrong. It was immoral. It was harmful both to blacks and to whites. It was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. And we succeeded in, in abolishing segregation in lunch counters, and buses, public transportation, public accommodations, employment, the Voting Rights Act. We passed a law prohibiting ongoing discrimination in housing, but we left untouched the biggest segregation of all, the existing segregation of every metropolitan area in this country clearly defined areas that are either all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that are either all black or mostly black. How could it be that we came to understand that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, and leave untouched the biggest segregation of all? We're an apartheid society when it comes to housing, residential neighborhoods. Well, partly it's because Residential segregation is harder to undo than the forms of segregation that we challenged in the 20th century. If we pass a law prohibiting the segregation of water fountains, the next day you drink from any water fountain. But we pass a law prohibiting the segregation of neighborhoods, the next, thing wouldn't, next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, is adopted a national rationalization, a myth that uh, excuses ourselves, we use to excuse ourselves from addressing the biggest segregation of all. And that myth goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation that we abolished in the 20th century, they were civil rights violations. They were unconstitutional because they were created by government. If the federal government was creating segregation, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment. If state and local governments were creating segregation, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. These were civil rights violations, and we had an obligation to remedy them. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, oh, that's something entirely different. 
residential segregation wasn't created by government, not by law, by regulation, by ordinance. The reason we have residential segregation is because of private bigotry. Landlords or homeowners who wouldn't sell or rent to African Americans in white neighborhoods, or maybe the actions of private banks and real estate agents. Or maybe it's just because people like to live with each other of the same race. Or maybe it's because of income differences. Not government action, not government requirement. It just sort of happened this way as a result of these bigoted but private activities. And we tell ourselves if it happened by accident, it can only not happen by accident. Most of us think it's too bad, but we don't feel any obligation to do anything about it. Well, I used to be, as some of you may know, an education policy writer. I, I didn't know much about housing or about segregation for that matter, but I came to understand that the segregation of elementary and secondary schools was the biggest problem American public education faced. When we concentrate the most disadvantaged African American and other disadvantaged children in single neighborhoods, they come to school with overwhelming social and economic problems that make it impossible for schools to generate the kind of achievement that they would in schools where children didn't suffer these advantages. I remember I wrote a column once about asthma. As you may know, African American children in low income neighborhoods in this country have asthma at four times the rate of middle class children, four times the rate. They have asthma because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more diesel trucks driving through, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment. And I explained in this column, if you had two groups of children, identical in every respect, except one group of children had a high, higher rate of asthma than the other, that group was gonna have lower average achievement because many of the children in that group of asthmatics were gonna be up at night wheezing and come to school drowsy the next day. And if you have a group of children that is drowsier than another group, everything else being equal, that group's gonna have lower average achievement. And you can go through a condition after condition that children in low income segregated neighborhoods come to school with uh, that add up to the achievement gap that we have in schools, not just asthma, lead poisoning, homelessness, economic insecurity. And then on top of that, when you take children with these kinds of problems and you concentrate them in, different, in, in the same schools, it's impossible for those schools to achieve at the same level as schools where children come to school healthy, well-rested, well-nourished, access to fresh food, not in polluted neighborhoods, not overcrowded, uh, the inequality becomes inevitable. Well, we passed a law in 2001 called the No Child Left Behind Law that said we were gonna abolish the achievement gap in just a couple of years by testing children more and by holding teachers accountable for their test scores. It was a ludicrous theory. It didn't work, of course. Uh, we should have known at the beginning that it was ludicrous because the achievement gap is the result of segregated schools concentrating disadvantaged children in single schools. Well, the reason the schools are segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. Schools are more segregated today than any time in the last 50 years. And they're more segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think of neighborhood segregation as being a school problem. I wasn't really focused on housing yet. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it involved uh, two school districts, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of these school districts had a very, very trivial desegregation plan. They uh, enabled parents to choose which school their child would attend, but if the choice was going to exacerbate segregation, the choice wouldn't be honored. So if you had a school that was all white, mostly white, and they had, for example, one place left, both the black and the white child applied for it, the black child would be given some preference because it would help to desegregate the school. Well, the Supreme Court analyzed this program, said it was unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the controlling opinion. He said it's true, the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. It's a wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. But he said the neighborhoods are segregated de facto because of private bigotry people's self-choice to live in neighborhoods where they feel more comfortable with others of the same race, economic differences. And he said, where you have de facto segregation that wasn't created by government, you are not permitted under the constitution to take explicit action to redress it. 
Well, I read this decision, as I said, it involved two school districts, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. And I remembered reading about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, some years before. There was a white homeowner in a single family home in an all white suburb called Shively outside Louisville. He had an African-American friend, a decorated Navy veteran, wife and a child living in a rented apartment in downtown Louisville. The African-American friend wanted to buy a single family home. Nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shiley bought a second home and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American friend moved in, an angry mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop any of this. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition for having provoked a riot by selling a home to an African-American family in a white neighborhood. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the prosecutors are being used, employed to maintain racial boundaries in the, uh, the community of Louisville. And I looked into it a bit further and I found this was not just a border state phenomenon. There were instances of police protected mob, mob violence here in the Bay Area to drive African-Americans out of homes that they legitimately purchased or rented in white communities. The same thing happened in Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles and Boston and Washington throughout the country. There were hundreds and hundreds of these cases of police protected, sometimes even police organized violence designed to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Every one of these where the police was involved was a 14th Amendment violation, an unconstitutional action on the part of the state to enforce racial segregation that requires a remedy, but we've never remedied, remedied it. Well, I began to look into it further and I discovered it wasn't just police protected, police instigated violence that maintained racial boundaries in this country. There were many, many federal, state and local policies that created the segregation that we know today, that policies that were so powerful in the 20th century that uh, their effects still are with us today. Uh, perhaps the most uh, powerful of these was a program of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration to suburbanize the entire white population that was living in cities, working class and middle class families, to get them out of cities into single family homes in all white suburbs like that suburb of Shively that I described in Louisville uh, a few minutes ago. This was an explicit racial policy of the federal government. Uh, you're familiar with these developments all over the country. Uh, they're here in San Francisco area. They were everywhere. Uh, perhaps the, the most famous one in this area is uh, Westlake uh, in Daly City. Uh, 15,000 homes in one place. Nationwide, the, the largest one was Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, 17,000 homes in one place. The builder of Westlake, uh, Henry Dolger, or Levittown in New York City, outside New York City, uh, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital to develop uh, projects that large for which they had no buyers as yet. Uh, no bank would be crazy enough to lend them the money to build these, these giant subdivisions. So we were in a suburban country at that time. The banks didn't think that anybody would want to live to these live in these places. The only people living in suburbs in, in the mid-20th century were affluent families. The only way that Levitt and Dolger and any of these other developers could uh, assemble the capital to buy the land and build the, the projects was by going to the federal government, the federal housing and veterans administrations, submitting their plans for the development, the the design of the homes, the architecture, the, the materials they were going to use, and and a commitment that the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administrations required never to sell a home to an African American. The Federal Housing Administration even required these developers to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This was a nationwide policy uh, and it created all white suburbs everywhere uh, in the country. Here in this area, uh, you may know this story. Uh, I told it in, in my book, The Color of Law. Uh, the great African, the, the great, I'm sorry, the great white novelist, uh, Wallace Stegner, uh, was recruited to teach at Stanford. 
uh, after World War II. He was well known at that time because he had written an autobiography called Big Rock Candy Mountain. He was recruited to teach writing at Stanford. Those days, uh, you'll forgive me, Rick, but uh, college professors weren't uh, paid the exorbitant salaries that they are today. Uh, they, uh, college professors were low class, working class uh, people like, like high school teachers or mail carriers or, or construction workers. There was no housing available for them in the immediate post-war period. So Wallace Stegner joined a cooperative of other people of similar means to buy land and build homes in which they could live. They bought a tract of land outside uh, Stanford, uh, Ladera. Uh, it was a ranch. Uh, they bought homes there. They bought, the, bought land there and planned to build uh, homes. There were 100 members of this cooperative. But the, when they went to bank to get loans, the banks wouldn't give them the loans to build the homes because the Federal Housing Administration wouldn't insure the loans. And the Federal Housing Administration wouldn't insure the loans because this cooperative had three African-American members in it. And the Federal Housing Administration told them that unless they expelled the three members from their cooperative, they wouldn't get bank guarantees to build the loan. Eventually, uh, the cooperative had to dissolve because it couldn't go ahead with this project. It resold the land to a, a, a private builder who was able to get federal bank guarantees for this development and FHA and VA mortgages. And the development was built and uh, exists to this day as a whites only development. It, 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 and this went on all over the country. Uh, those homes that were built uh, by the uh, uh, Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration developers who got bank guarantees from these federal agencies. Uh, and let me say that, uh, interrupt myself for a minute and say that uh, the, the policies of these federal agencies was, was not the action of rogue bureaucrats. It was explicitly written as a racial policy in the manual of the Federal Housing Administration that was distributed to appraisers all over the country who had to evaluate applications of builders uh, for loans, uh, for federal guarantees of loans. For example, who uh, denied uh, the, uh, the loans that the Stegner Cooperative uh, required uh, to build um, uh, its development. Uh, the appraiser had a copy of this manual. The manual said, it was a FHA manual, said you couldn't get, uh, recommend a federal bank guarantee for a loan for a development uh, that would include African Americans. You couldn't even, the manual said, guarantee a federal bank loan for an all white development that would be located near where African Americans were living because that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's a quote from the Federal Policy Manual. This notion of de facto segregation is utter nonsense. The entire country was suburbanized on a whites only basis by this explicit racial policy of the federal government. Well, those homes that in the post-World War II period were inexpensive. They were, as I say, for returning war veterans, uh, people who had jobs in the post-war economy, blacks and whites, who could afford to buy homes, but for whom no homes were uh, available. The, um, the policy has suburbanized the white population, but they were inexpensive homes. They uh, cost maybe $8,000, $9,000. Uh, some in Westlake uh, cost as much as $10,000. Levittown was close to the $8,000. In today's money, that's about $100,000 inflation adjusted. As you all know, it will be no surprise to you when I tell you that those homes no longer sell for $100,000. Uh, $300,000, dollars dollars $500,000 in some parts of the country. In this community, over a million dollars. The white families who bought those homes over the next couple of generations gained equity from the appreciation and the value of their homes. Uh, most Americans who have wealth gain it from the equity in their homes. The, the white families who live in these developments gained that wealth. They used it to send their children to college. They used it to take care of emergencies. They used it to uh, maybe a, a, a temporary unemployment or, or medical emergencies. They used it to uh, finance their retirements and they used it to uh, bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had uh, down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited by explicit federal policy from uh, uh, participating in this wealth generating exercise. The result is that today, on average, African-American families 
have incomes of about 60% of white incomes. You'd expect that people with similar incomes would get to have similar wealth. Uh, but in fact, while African-American incomes are 60% on average of white incomes, African-American wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio or 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century and that the, uh, determines the wealth gap that we have today. That wealth gap uh, determines not only the achievement gap in schools that I began by talking about because by effectively prohibiting African-Americans from having the wealth, the down payments, outside the most uh, dangerous, concentrated, uh, poorly resourced neighborhoods. Uh, the wealth gap uh, predicts uh, shorter average life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease for African-Americans than for whites, because so many African-Americans, not all, but so many live in more polluted uh, neighborhoods, uh, less healthy neighbors, less access to health care less access to, to markets to sell fresh food. It predicts the mass incarceration crisis and the police abuse that we've spent so much time talking about and, and demonstrating about in the last couple of months. I'm not suggesting that police would not discriminate in the absence of segregation, but it would be much more difficult uh, when we concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to jobs, without access to even the transportation to get to good jobs. Uh, without uh, access to schools that have high achieving students. When we concentrate those young men in single neighborhoods, the police become an occupying force. They engage in inevitable confrontations with those young men leading to the kind of violence and, and incarceration that we're struggling to understand and uh, do something about today. And I'd say that the segregation that we've created uh, as a result of um, uh, these public policies, these unconstitutional policies, also predicts uh, the very, very dangerous and frightening to me, and I, I think probably to many of you, political polarization that we have in this country today. It largely tracks racial lines. Uh, it's not entirely racial, but largely tracks racial lines. How can we ever expect to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other? that they have no ability to understand each other, to empathize with each other, to develop a common national identity that's essential for the preservation of this democracy. So the wealth gap alone uh, that we've created through unconstitutional public policy uh, is a, a serious threat to the existence of our democracy. Well, there were many, many other policies that federal, state, and local governments followed uh, to create segregation. Uh, I'll uh, mention uh, just one other big federal policy. I don't have time to go into many others, but one is public housing, something else that we all misunderstand. Uh, public housing, we think, is a place where poor people live, uh, lots of young mothers, single mothers with children, lots of young men without uh, jobs in the formal economy, as I said. Uh, that's not how public housing began. Public housing began not for poor people, but for working families, working class uh, families, uh, in the Depression, in the New Deal, the Roosevelt administration. The Roosevelt administration in 1933 built the first civilian public housing in this country. The Public Works Administration built this public housing for working families. As I said, the uh, poor people weren't permitted into public housing. We had, of course, in the Depression, a 25% uh, unemployment rate. Public housing was for the 75% who had good, stable jobs, who could show they could afford to, to pay full rent for the housing that the government was creating in these public projects. Uh, there was no housing available for them outside the public projects because construction activity had slowed down during the depression. That was the purpose of public housing was to provide housing options for families who could afford it, but for whom no housing was available. But everywhere that the Public Works Administration, the first New Deal agency built this public housing, it segregated them, creating separate projects for African-Americans and whites frequently segregating communities that hadn't previously been segregated. We were a much more integrated country in the early 20th century than we are today, not entirely integrated, but we had many downtown 
integrated neighborhoods simply because most jobs were concentrated in a single downtown factory district. We were a manufacturing economy. I know in Palo Alto, that's hard to imagine, but there was none of that internet stuff in those days. You know, the um, people were making things and they needed to be, uh, the jobs needed to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals to get the parts and ship their final products. So you had neighborhoods that, that included both black and white workers who were walking to work. They didn't have cars. So they were broadly integrated neighborhoods. I'm not suggesting that every other house was a different race, but they were broad. In The Color of Law, my book, I, I, just, I, I refer to uh, the autobiography of the great African-American novelist, playwright Langston Hughes. Wrote in his autobiography that he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. He said his best friend was Polish. Said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. It's what you'd expect to happen in an integrated neighborhood with an integrated high school. Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood of Cleveland, demolished housing, and created two separate projects, one for African Americans, one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation with that projects elsewhere in Cleveland that persists to this day. Uh, in, in my book, uh, I like to um, uh, talk about the self-satisfied smug places, not only you, but the other places as well. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, the area between Harvard and MIT in the 1930s was a fully integrated neighborhood, about half black, half white. Public Works Administration, Central Square neighborhood was called, as the Public Works Administration uh, went into that neighborhood, demolished housing, and built separate projects for whites, separate projects for blacks, uh, creating and sustaining a, a pattern of segregation with that and other projects in the Boston area that um, uh, persists to this day. Here on the West Coast, this was a very, very powerful way of creating segregation. As uh, those of you who, who know uh, the history of migration in this country, internal migration, know uh, there weren't very many African Americans here on the West Coast prior to World War II. It was the second great migration that brought African Americans from the former slave holding states to the West Coast uh, in, in, to take jobs in, in war industries during the war, mostly shipbuilding and and aircraft, but uh, other war industries as well. The government had to build housing for these workers uh, if they weren't, uh, if they were going to get the ships and the aircraft and the tanks and the jeeps produced. And so it did. It built housing for war workers during World War II here on the West Coast and elsewhere in the country, and everywhere segregated them. Segregated workers in their housing who were working on the same aircraft and shipyards, aircraft plants and shipyards. Uh, in San Francisco, the government built uh, five projects, uh, mostly for shipyard workers. Four were for whites only. One was for African Americans in the Fillmore District. That became the black neighborhood of San Francisco because of this federal policy. In Los Angeles, uh, there was a, uh, uh, an aircraft ca uh, factory in Santa Monica. Uh, the federal government built the housing for those black workers who lived there, who worked there in Watts which became a black neighborhood. It wasn't a black neighborhood before World War II. Um, in Portland and Seattle, as I say, Los Angeles and the Bay Area, the segregation that we know today was created in the first instance in a very powerful way by federal housing policy during World War II. Well, after the war, there was still an enormous housing shortage. Uh, much as there is today, uh, there was no uh, housing being built by the private sector, as I said, during the Depression to speak of. And uh, during World War II, it was an illegal to use uh, construction materials for civilian purposes, unless it for ha was for housing war workers. So we had an enormous housing shortage when millions of returning war veterans were coming home. Uh, President Truman uh, had to respond to this crisis, uh, and he did. He proposed a vast expansion of the public housing program. And remember, this was the most desirable housing available. It was not for poor people, mostly for whites, uh, but he wanted to expand it in order to take care of the homelessness crisis of returning war veterans. Conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's uh, proposal for expanded public housing because they thought public housing was socialistic. The government shouldn't be involved in public housing. The private sector should be taking care of it even though the private sector wasn't doing anything to build housing for middle-class, working-class families returning war veterans. Uh, 
they proposed, a, a, they had a tactic to defeat Truman's expansion of public housing. They proposed what we call a poison pill amendment. I'm sure some of you have heard that term. A poison pill amendment is an amendment that uh, opponents of legislation try to attach to a bill. They think they can get a majority for this amendment. But when the amendment is adopted and the full bill comes back on the floor of the House and Senate with this amendment attached, that amendment makes a different majority oppose the bill and the entire bill goes down to defeat. So conservatives in Congress proposed a, an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act that said from now on, public housing has to be non-discriminatory. No more of this racial discrimination in public housing. It was of course a cynical proposal. They didn't want public housing at all, but they planned to vote for it. They uh, thought they would get uh, Northern Democrats who were opposed to segregation to join with them. That would create a majority. And then when the final bill came up on the floor of the Senate requiring non-discriminatory public housing, the conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by Southern Democrats and the entire public housing program went down to defeat. So liberals who, who supported integration had a difficult choice to make. Were they going to support the non-discrimination amendment and, and uh, ensure that no housing would be built? Or were they going to oppose the non-discrimination amendment in order to ensure the, the creation of more public housing and address the homelessness crisis that we were facing? Well, they decided to oppose the amendment. The leading liberal in the Senate at that time was uh, Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois. He got up on the floor of the House and Senate, of the, of the Senate rather, he got up on the floor of the Senate and made a speech along the following lines. He said, I want to say to my Negro friends that you'll be better off if the amendment is defeated and you get the housing that you need than you will be if the amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. Well, in retrospect, I don't think we were better off. Uh, the federal government used that vote. They succeeded in uh, defeating the non-discrimination amendment. Uh, they used that vote as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs, not just public housing, uh, uh, for the next 15 years, really almost 15 years until President Kennedy in 1962 issued an executive order for the first time uh, telling uh, federal agencies that they could no longer support segregation in housing. That's when it ended uh, legally, um, not until 1962. Well, it was a difficult choice that Senator Douglas and his federal li fe fellow liberals uh, made at the time. Um, it was a devil's bargain they were asked, being asked to make. The housing crisis was real. They wanted to solve it. They also wanted to end discrimination, racial discrimination in housing. They couldn't do both. They made a difficult choice and we're making the same choice today. The limited programs that we have to subsidize uh, housing for low-income families, disproportionately African-American and Hispanic, are disproportionately placed in low-income segregated neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation for exactly the same reason that uh, Douglas made the choice he did because it's easier to build low-income housing for disproportionately for minority families in existing low-income neighborhoods. If you try to do it in higher opportunity neighborhoods, you run into uh, lots of community opposition. Uh, you have to hold 100 community meetings trying to defend your decision to place uh, garden apartments even or, or uh, townhouses or low-level apartment buildings in, uh, 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 many, in communities that have greater opportunity. The land is more expensive there. Uh, in, in a low-income community, you can place a, a low-income housing tax credit development, for example, uh, and have lots of potential renters walk by and seeing for rent signs in the window. So it's the easy route to take. We're making the same mistake today by reinforcing segregation uh, that Douglas and his fellow liberals made in 1949. Well, the policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Uh, the, uh, the think tanks and housing experts know exactly what we should do. Uh, I just alluded to one of the things we should do. We should prohibit zoning ordinances that uh, allow only single family homes on large lot sizes to be built in many predominantly white or all white communities to permit housing for working class, uh, middle class uh, families, many of whom uh, would be African American and Hispanic to live in those communities. Uh, we should um, uh, be modifying the Section 8 program, 
the subsidy that we give to low-income families uh, to be able to rent apartments. Uh, we should be modifying that to take advantage of the abolition of exclusionary zoning so that they can live in higher opportunity communities with access to jobs and transportation to them, uh, schools with high achievement, healthy air, and good food. We should do much more expensive things. We need to subsidize <clears throat> the movement of African Americans in particular, because they are the victims of, of a constitutional prohibition uh, that, uh, uh, on discrimination in the mid 20th century, we, sh we should be subsidizing African Americans to move into high opportunity communities that are now unaffordable to them. Uh, they were affordable, as I said, they cost about $100,000 a piece of uh, those homes in the mid 20th century, uh, affordable both to blacks and whites, and now unaffordable uh, to working class families of either race. That was a constitutional violation to prohibit African Americans from moving to them. A very, very narrowly targeted constitutional remedy should be an affirmative action program that, that funds the movement of African Americans into communities from which they were previously excluded. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I, I published in the, the Sunday New York Times an article about a neighboring community of yours, San Mateo, uh, where homes that in the mid 20th century that sold for, as I said, about $100,000 now sell for a million and a half dollars in an all white community. They wouldn't, it wouldn't have been all white uh, had the, the community uh, not been discriminatory when it uh, was created. Uh, the federal government created its segregation. It was uh, the, the actions of the federal government that required the cooperation of both banks and realtors and developers, all of whom still exist today in those communities, those, those uh, private institutions should be tapped to contribute to such funds to subsidize uh, the movement of African Americans into places from which they've previously been excluded. So the policies to redress segregation, as I said, are well known. Uh, there's no mystery about it. What's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to, in the words of John Lewis that we've paid so much attention to in the last uh, month or so since he passed away, make good trouble to make it uncomfortable to maintain the segregated patterns that we have created. Every one of us as American citizens has an obligation to participate in the remedy of civil rights violations. Uh, I am working with a, a, a group of national civil rights leaders and fair housing advocates to create a new national committee to redress segregation, uh, to try to create the kind of uh, pressure on communities like yours to redress its segregation. Uh, we were going to launch it uh, just before the pandemic uh, uh, shut us down. Uh, we're going to launch it very soon again. And uh, if uh, any of you are interested in being on the mailing list for the launch, uh, you can let me know and I'll be sure that uh, you get, a, get that announcement. So um, I want to thank you for, for the attention that you've paid uh, to this, these remarks. Let me just actually, I just thought one other thing I'd like to say, uh, Rick mentioned before, he's talking about the, uh, how we teach at the uh, college level, I guess, about the history of segregation. Well, in the course of writing my book, uh, I, I examined uh, the high school textbooks that are used in every American history class uh, in this country at the high school level. Every one of them lies about this history. Every one of them uh, perpetuates the myth of de facto segregation. Uh, every one of them talks about the great deeds that the uh, New Deal um, did. And, and there were great deeds of uh, creating the first public housing, of uh, suburbanizing the country, never once mentioning that it was for whites only. Well, every one of you lives in a school district, can uh, have some influence over the school board and the superintendent and the principals of your schools to stop misteaching this history. Uh, and um, I think that's an action that everyone can take um, immediately without waiting for a new civil rights movement uh, to emerge. So again, thank you for your attention. And um, Rick, I'd be glad to engage in discussion and answer any questions uh, that people might have. Um, there, there's a lot to like about this book. It's a wonderful book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for sharing it with everyone. I can tell by how many questions we have coming in that people are deeply engaged. Uh, I, heard, I urged everyone to read the book. If they haven't read the book, uh, you will learn something new.
uh, or be surprised about something you thought you knew, which is not really true in every single chapter. Uh, so that's one of the virtues of the book, that every single chapter brings something new or surprising. So it's, it's a very good read. Uh, second, it's such a good read in part because you do take the story of law and policy and you look at many different places where policies are made, uh, but, and you also humanize those policies by bringing people in. So this is not simply a story about what government did. It's also a story about how the actions of government have shaped people's lives. And in fact, the lives of people right here in the Bay Area, uh, the cent probably the central character family in the book is right here in the Bay Area. So it definitely, it also has a local flavor to it. So I think people would really appreciate that. Third point I, I wanna mention uh, is one that you crystallized here even more sharply than you did in the story. So the, the book is, is titled, the subtitle is A Forgotten History. Uh, and you talk in the book about how this history has been forgotten, right? So there's a reference to the fact that there is a lot of, of scholarly research about segregation, uh, you know, going back to Massey and Denton and Crabgrass Frontier and so forth. We have a lot of books that have been written about segregation, yet somehow Justice John Roberts could then write an opinion in 2007 where he acts as though that literature doesn't exist. Uh, and speaks about de facto segregation, uh, completely effacing the role of government. And the wonderful point you made here is that that forgetting is not the, the usual forgetting, it's a motivated forgetting. Uh, it's something that we have wanted to forget because if we were to remember and to really come to grips with what we've done as a nation, that would raise some really difficult and uncomfortable questions. Uh, about who we are as a nation. So that's a point worth keeping in mind that the forgetting has been motivated. Uh, final uh, point I wanna raise in terms of the book's many virtues, and there are many more, uh, but one that, that, that sits with me right now is how you pull from so many parts of the country. Um, so wherever you're from, whether you're from California or if you're from uh, the Midwest, or if you're from Cleveland like I am, you can find some parts of this book that will likely speak to your own family's experience. And for me, that point in the book was when you talked about Langston Hughes. Because as it turns out, Langston Hughes went to the same uh, middle school that my father went to in Cleveland. Uh, he was a class poet at Kennard Junior High School uh, some decades before my father was a class poet at Kennard Junior High School. And the interesting thing, though, about my father's upbringing in Cleveland, where I was raised as well, is that my father was raised in a more integrated, though poor, environment than I was, which is, speaks to exactly what you were talking about. We imagine that segregation has sort of always been here and that the Black neighborhoods were the Black neighborhoods 50, 70, 80 years ago, but in fact, they weren't. Segregation was actually created by people uh, over a period of time. Which now brings me to my first question, which is, uh, you know, one, one of the striking things about the book is how pervasive the system is, right? It's not only in the South, it's in the North, it's in California, it's not only courts, it's local officials, it's state officials, it's federal government officials, it's real estate agents and housing boards, it's financing people, it's pervasive. And when we look back on this, uh, and I think many people have had this reaction listening to you and reading the book, you can't but feel uh, repelled uh, or repulsed or uh, nauseated uh, by what has happened. Yet these are practices that were undertaken or at least you know, allowed to happen by countless people um, throughout the nation. So how is it that so many people throughout our nation, people who thought of themselves, no doubt, as good people, uh, they went along with the creation of a system that, at least from your perspective and hopefully our perspective now, seems so obviously pernicious. Well, you know, as a nation, we've never really dealt with the uh, legacy of slavery, uh, not to mention Jim Crow. Uh, we've never had the kind of uh, truth and reconciliation uh, commission as they uh, developed in South Africa. We never confronted our past the way they did in Germany after the Holocaust. Uh, we're now having a more accurate and passionate discussion about race, uh, about the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow than we ever had had before in American history. But, um, and I'm hopeful uh, that uh, that will uh, lay the foundation for a new civil rights movement to address this, but we haven't had that discussion. And uh, 
you know, the, the, when you create these systems, they become self-reinforcing and, and self-perpetuating. So, for example, uh, why did whites go along with it, to take uh, the, that, that form of the question. When you herd African Americans into slums in overcrowded conditions because they have no opportunities to find housing in less overcrowded places, um, and you deny, as uh, I talk about in the book, public services, correct, collect garbage uh, less frequently, uh, uh, don't provide the uh, sidewalks and sewers in many African-American neighborhoods. Well, whites look at these neighborhoods and they say, oh, African-Americans are slum people. We don't want them in our neighborhood. Not understanding that these slum conditions were not created by the people, but by the um, uh, policies of government that create that that force them into these neighborhoods so it becomes self-perpetuating um, uh, as i said in, in uh, we we teach it in schools uh that uh, this is all just happened uh, by happenstance uh, that helps uh do it uh in the chat room by the way i uh, i did put uh, both a curriculum for high school teachers uh a curriculum unit, it's a, just a week-long unit, uh, and a 17-minute animated film for high school teachers that tries to uh, use this history. They're both free, and your attendees can use it, um, can access it. Uh, I also put in the chat room a, um, a link to the article I mentioned before about San Mateo, uh, where good people who participated in the Black Lives Matter movement had no idea that they were living in communities that were all white, not by happenstance. Uh, you're right, the history was well known, and, and it's not just because it was in scholarly works, let me say. Uh, it was uh, well known to every, every person. When, when somebody uh, in uh, a working class family or a middle class family, white, was um, in a segregated white public housing project, they knew that this was public policy, that was no, no it wasn't hidden that uh, they were living in an all white project and uh, uh, nearby there was an all black project. When uh, uh, families moved into Westlake or Levittown and they had uh, deeds to their homes that prohibited them from selling or renting to an African American, uh, they, uh, if they bothered to read their deeds, which uh, many people at least look at when they buy a home, uh, uh, they knew that this was, uh, and they knew they had FHA mortgages on those homes or VA mortgages. So they knew this was public policy. It was no secret. Um, I think, though, that, uh, as I said uh, in, in the beginning of my, my answer, I think that the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, the conversations we've been having before the Black Lives Matter demonstrations about the history of slavery and Jim Crow um, are encouraging. Uh, they haven't yet led to uh, action to redress uh, residential segregation, but at least they lay a better foundation for it than we ever have had before. That's a wonderful point. You, you reminded me, you know, Brian Stevenson has, has said once in conversation that uh, he made reference to truth and reconciliation. And he says the problem in the United States is that sometimes people want to jump over the truth part and go straight to reconciliation. That seems like what we're what we're confronting here. So you you mentioned so one of the challenges here. You said the remedies are well known, uh, and I'm struggling now when I hear these remedies to to find some optimism or sense of possibility here, frankly, because the the chance for redress through the courts is slim or none. Um, that's very unlikely uh, with the judges we have. And even if frankly Barack Obama had appointed uh, even more judges, it would still be very unlikely. Uh, and then. You know, one proposal you mentioned is to, to get rid of the single family residential zoning restriction and minimum lot size requirements, which practically every city has, including Palo Alto. Uh, I don't see a groundswell of support for that. So could you say something about the path to generating the political will to make the changes that would be necessary to make us a more integrated society? Sure. Uh, Rick, you're a law professor, right? Yep. Uh, well, that's why you're so conservative in your views about how the law changes. Uh, um, Brown versus Board of Education was inconceivable just a few years before it was uh, uh, issued. Uh, I'm old enough, as you may be able mm -hmm. to see, to remember when uh, it was inconceivable that we would ever desegregate water fountains or buses right. or uh, 
of, of public well, let me, accommodations of any kind. Let, let me add in there, though, with, with Brown v. Board, you know, one of the things to keep in mind with Brown v. Board is that the Supreme Court did not decide Brown v. Board because it was concerned about black, black kids in school, right? We were in a Cold War battle. The image of the United States was at stake. Uh, we had to show that our democracy could live up to our aspirations. Uh, so we needed some good PR there. Uh, it's not clear if it weren't for the PR effect that Brown would have happened as it did. And as you know, even after Brown, there wasn't much integration that actually occurred anyway. Oh, I, I agree with you uh, entirely about that. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, reinforces a, a point that I made. I don't think Brown was uh, um, issued because of the powerful legal arguments that the uh, uh, litigators made. You know, there was a, 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 a very well-known um, uh, journalist uh, at the turn of the 20th century, 120 years ago uh, or so. His name was Peter Finley Dunn. And he used to write uh, articles about an Irishman sitting at a bar, an Irish immigrant sitting at a bar and speaking in brogue, and his columns were in brogue. And uh, the most famous aphorism of uh, uh, this Irishman, whose name was Mr. Dooley, was the Supreme Court follows the election returns. And uh, what he was saying was not just about elections, but that you know, the, on the issues of race, the Supreme Court has flipped back and forth so many times because of what was going on in the broader society. And that's why, as I said, uh, this is not going to happen only because of uh, the, the persuasiveness of litigators, although that's part of it. You know, you mentioned that uh, John Roberts was able to ignore this history. Part of the reason he was able to ignore this history is because the litigators didn't use it in their um, arguments. Uh, this uh, history is, uh, has been forgotten by many civil rights advocates as well. And uh, if uh, courts began to have to confront this history in a more aggressive way than uh, they previously have, they would at least, uh, you might get a few precedents at lower levels that might later be based, uh, be able to uh, be used uh, in the future at higher levels. But, but Richard, you don't think the primary change is going to come through the courts, though, right? I mean, you no, think that absolutely the... not. Okay, no, as so... I said, it's, no, it's, it's got to be uh, by making good trouble. Okay, so, so tell us about the good trouble that you're going to make and that hopefully some of the people listening can help you make. Well, I'm too old to make it, uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm, it's going to have to be the people who are listening to me. But for example, uh, you know, I, I, and I'm referring now again to this uh, uh, article I, I wrote a couple weeks ago in the Times about San Mateo. In that article, I identified the actual realtors and uh, developers and banks that segregated uh, San Mateo. And I suggested that uh, out of the Black Lives Matter movement in San Mateo, mm -hmm. there could be developed a carefully planned campaign to get those uh, real estate, that real estate agency, that bank, and that developer to create a fund that would subsidize uh, the movement of, of uh, African Americans into parts of San Mateo that they're not mm -hmm. presently uh, able to live in, and that would do things short of that. I'm not the, you know, the, the actual, the, that article wasn't actually the best, uh, San Mateo wasn't the best, best place to illustrate uh, in writing that article because the difference between the $100,000 that the homes were built for and $1.5 million mm -hmm. uh, that they now sell for is very, very enormous. But there are many places in this country where those $100,000 homes don't sell for one and a half million dollars, they sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. Uh, most places in the country are, are like that. And uh, it is practical mm -hmm. to create subsidies that uh, would be sufficient to enable African Americans to move to those places if the proper pressure were, were created. So I don't think it's a, an impractical model, but that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to do. Um, I don't want to, well, let me, can I take another minute to tell you a story? Okay. Um, I, uh, I gave a talk uh, in Kansas City a, a while ago, just before actually the, my talks ended uh, live because of the pandemic. And um, I, after my talk, there was a panel and the mayor of San Kansas City was on the panel. And we were talking about the fact that the, the white areas of Kansas City uh, was zoned for single family homes only ensuring they're all white character. Mm 
Uh, and I said to him, well, why don't you abolish single family zoning in the city? Because he seemed to think there was a problem that it was so segregated. And he said, well, he said the city council would never approve it. So I said, well, how many votes are there in the city council to abolish single family zoning? He said four, maybe five. I said, out of how many city council people? He said 13. So, you know, I'm not so good at math, but I, I did a quick calculation in my head. And I said, so you need two more council people uh, to abolish single family zoning. He said, yeah. I said, well, of the remaining council people, the remaining seven council people, who are the two most likely to succumb to pressure if uh, uh, a movement was created to abolish single family zoning? He said, well, maybe districts four and district six. So then I turned to this audience of 300 people. This was a live audience, uh, most of whom were uh, supportive of uh, civil rights and housing opportunities. And I said to you, how many of you live in districts four and district six? And about 50 people raised their hands. So I suggested that maybe they might begin to meet with each other and figure out how to create a campaign to uh, get these two city council people to abolish single family zoning in the, in the city of Kansas City. So there are things that are possible to do. It's not gonna be easy. Uh, as, as you know, from the uh, remembrances of John Lewis's life and the, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, it wasn't easy then either. And this is not gonna be easy either, but it's possible. And are nobody there, thought it was possible before it happened. And it didn't happen. Uh, you're absolutely right. It happened because of the Cold War. It happened because of the, the marches and demonstrations that became impossible to suppress. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not confident that we can do the same thing around housing segregation, but I'm hopeful that we can. Are there, are there any uh, models of integration that you would point us to as showing the way forward? Well, there are many, many uh, uh, localities that have modest programs in the right direction. They're not universal enough. They're not strong enough. There are, for example, uh, uh, many places uh, that, uh, including in the Bay Area, that have down payment assistance programs for first time home buyers who are disproportionately minority that go part of the way to helping solve this problem. There are uh, many communities uh, uh, California, in this case, is one uh, that prohibits discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders. Most of the country does not. Most of the country uh, does not consider it a violation of the Fair Housing Act to say you won't rent to a Section 8 voucher holder. Uh, but there are many communities that uh, make that unlawful. So uh, that can be done elsewhere. Uh, there are um, places that uh, have um, preserved stable integration with uh, very aggressive programs on the part of the real estate industry. Uh, they prohibit lawn signs that uh, advertise for sale homes, for example, to uh, prevent uh, a panic flight. Uh, they, uh, the real estate industry in the community, I'm talking think particularly of Oak Park, Illinois, uh, where the real estate industry very aggressively shows homes in opposite race neighborhoods to families who um, seek to move to the community. And that's a model. Uh, that could be uh, implemented widely because we have many neighborhoods in transition now where we have temporary seeming integration, uh, but they're flipping from uh, all white to, uh, from, from all black to all white uh, and gentrifying neighborhoods. So that, that could be a, a model. So there are many, many places in the country that are uh, implementing small programs. There are mobility programs um, uh, of uh, uh, extra uh, top-off uh, uh, payments for Section 8 voucher holders to permit them to move to higher opportunity neighborhoods and that counsel them uh, if they want to uh, do so. Uh, so that would be a, 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 a model. Uh, there are some communities uh, that do a better job of placing uh, low-income housing tax credit uh, units into higher opportunity uh, neighborhoods. Uh, there was a, a, a Supreme Court case in 2015 that uh, in which the court, um, uh, in part because of this history of recognizing it for the first time, uh, said that uh, the placement of uh, disparately of low-income housing tax credits uh, only in um, existing uh, minority neighborhoods could have a disparate impact uh, on uh, African-Americans in particular. And um, 
that uh, it didn't order, this was a Texas case, it didn't order, uh, it sent it back to the lower courts, it didn't order uh, the state to place more um, uh, light tech developments, low income housing tax credit so, developments in higher opportunity communities. So let me let but, me just uh, pick up on that on that point, because we have a lot of questions coming in. I'm okay. going to try to get to as many questions as we can. But so you're referring to the inclusive communities uh, project yes. uh, case, and which was a, a case where the Supreme Court determined that you could find a there is a, a right of action for disparate impact under the federal housing law. And the question that a number of people have had about the Federal Housing Act passed in 1968 is, do we need simply more stringent enforcement of that federal law, or do we also need a different federal law? We need both. We need both. <laughs> uh, we are not enforcing the Fair Housing okay. Act very well, uh, and we need to do a better job of it. But uh, the, and so if, so if Joe Biden wins and, you know, you're tasked with, with federal housing policy, what's your number one recommendation for him? I don't have any recommendations for Joe Biden. I have recommendations for people in local civil rights groups to make it possible for Joe Biden to do something. Okay. I'm not, I don't think that this is, a, this is relevant to federal policy yet. Okay. Um, any more than that you could recommend to Lyndon Johnson that he enforced civil rights before there were marches in the street yep. that forced him to do so. Okay, and one, one uh, impediment, right, to getting the political will to develop is that there, there are lots of African Americans, some of whom have submitted questions here, I believe, that, that wonder, why should we push integration so much? Uh, doesn't that rely on some notion that black people need to live next to white people to get the good things in life? Why not, they argue, simply reinvest in existing black neighborhoods? Uh, so what do you think about that path to reform? Well, first of all, I'm not suggesting anybody should live in an integrated neighborhood if they don't want to. But the evidence shows that when we create opportunities to move to higher opportunity neighborhoods, there are many African Americans, uh, the, line, the waiting lists are long for those programs. Uh, as for example, in the mobility programs I referred to before. But the notion that you can preserve segregation in a highly resourced minority community is mm -hmm. fantasy. Because if you do improve the resources in low income, uh, black, for example, neighborhoods, uh, if you succeed in doing so, and we've never succeeded in doing so because there's never support for doing it, but if you do, whites will wanna move in. So you'll create integration in that way. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to investing. I think we should invest more resources in low income segregated neighborhoods, but I don't deceive myself that that's gonna preserve their segregation. Uh, because uh, then the problem becomes how do you prevent uh, the massive displacement of existing residents from neighborhoods which, were, are, which are improving. We call it gentrification. That's what improving the resources in low-income segregated neighborhoods uh, looks like. It's and uh, we have to enact policies that prevent massive displacement when that occurs. Oh, no, that, that's a really great point. The, um, uh, we have a number of, of issues. I want to be sure we cut, cut, uh, get to the local issue. So a lot of people are concerned about these issues right on the peninsula uh, and in Palo Alto. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but if you drive along El Camino uh, Real, you see uh, recreational vehicles parked along the street. And we have people basically living in vehicles uh, in Palo Alto because they can't afford housing. Uh, and there are you know, maybe hundreds uh, of people who, who do that on a regular basis. Uh, we also have an issue uh, with one of the parks in Palo Alto, the Foothills Park. I don't know if you're familiar with that. This has been open only to Palo Alto residents for many years. It's a beautiful, uh, expansive open space area back in the foothills. Uh, and it's been only open to Palo Alto residents. And if you try to get in and you're not a Palo Alto resident, you're, you're subject to a criminal fine. So uh, two issues. Uh, one is advice to uh, activists or uh, advocates for affordable housing in Palo Alto or on the peninsula uh, who have confronted resistance. Uh, what can people do locally on the ground to try to make change in this very community? And then second, the exclusion of non-Palo Alto residents from this beautiful open space. Does that tie into the issues you raise in your book or is that completely separate? Well, it's not, it's not completely separate. It certainly reinforces the segregation of the community. Uh, 
but what can people do, uh, local people do? Well, I, I gave an example earlier. We can abolish uh, the kind of zoning that prevents uh, more diverse residences and therefore more diverse populations from living in the community. That would be one example of something we can do. So another question we have is uh, asking about people of different races, uh, uh, Latinos, uh, Asian Americans, for example. Uh, the book is titled uh, a, a Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. But in the book itself, you talk mostly about black and white, right? And other groups make, you know, a few appearances. So uh, talk some about that, the centrality of African Americans in the story and the, and the marginality of Asian Americans and Latinos. Well, um, this is a complicated issue you're raising. The, there were very few um, Asian Americans or Latinos in much of the country at the time these policies were implemented. There were certainly state policies in California, in Texas, in Colorado that were directed at segregating uh, Latinos and the Native Americans. But um, the policies that I describe in the book uh, were directed primarily at African Americans because those are the only people uh, whom the policymakers were thinking about. Uh, you know, we didn't even have a baseball team west of the Mississippi River when these policies were implemented. Mm -hmm. We weren't really the kind of national uh, country that we are today. Now, it's true that uh, if, if we remedied these policies that were directed at African Americans, that were unconstitutional because they were directed at African Americans, if we remedied them, many people would benefit from the remedies. Uh, Hispanics in particular uh, would benefit from them. Uh, they are uh, closed out of uh, many communities as well. So uh, the benefits would be shared beyond the African-American community. Uh, but the policies that I described were directed at uh, primarily at African-Americans. Okay, so let me, I wanna come back one more time to your recommendation that we get rid of the single family zoning requirements. Um, because again, that's something that's on a lot of people's minds and it's hard to imagine because most homeowners uh, might be with you in principle, right? They're for social justice and they say the right things, but then when it comes down to it, they are uh, worried uh, and deeply concerned about what zoning changes would mean for their property values, which as you've mentioned is likely the biggest investment in most people's lives. So what do you tell the homeowner who says, sure, I'm all for integration, uh, but I don't want to make changes that undermine the value of my home? They did it in Minneapolis. They did it in Portland. Um, it's not inconceivable that um, pressure can be placed uh, based largely on knowledge of the history of how this community uh, got to be the way it is that leads to that kind of change. And by the way, I don't think abolishing single families itself will do anything uh, in terms of the, the segregation that we've created. It's a first necessary step. Mm -hmm. But if you simply abolish single family zoning, as in Minneapolis, for example, you'll create lots of opportunities for uh, professionals in the, uh, who can't afford, young professionals, who can't afford to, to buy housing in the communities where they grew up. but uh, can now buy uh, uh, condominiums or, tri or, or units in triplexes, which are now permitted in a place like Minneapolis. So single family zoning abolishing is a first step and it's been done in some places and it's, and it's, it's being talked about in others as well. So uh, none of this is easy, but it won't happen without a civil rights movement. Minneapolis actually had a very, very uh, aggressive public campaign about the history of how Minneapolis came to be segregated before the uh, issue of single family zoning ever came up. Well, let me offer, offer one possibility that, that you did not mention, which is that the, the I mean, part of the, the reason we have every neighborhood and every community in, in effect acting to exclude uh, disadvantaged people, uh, including African-Americans, is that they worry that if they let them in, then they'll take all of them. Right, so you kind of have uh, communities trying to to compete with each other to have the highest property values and the and the most exclusive community. Uh, 
one way to address this problem, which I don't think you've mentioned, would basically be able to take all the control uh, for zoning and housing matters, take it away from the local decision makers and have all those decisions be made either, either at a regional level or at a state level. Is that, does that seem attractive to you? Absolutely. I, I, I think, uh, yes, I, I think that um, exclusionary zoning is, as I said earlier, I think it's unconstitutional uh, because it perpetuates an unconstitutionally created segregation and therefore uh, should be deemed unconstitutional itself. And I think it should be abolished not only at the state level by nation, but nationwide. It wasn't always uh, uh, permitted. The Supreme Court, as I said before, flips back and forth on all of these issues. It didn't permit this kind of zoning until 1926. And uh, I think that was a flawed decision on the part of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And um, we can see that reverse as well. So it should be done not just at the local level, but the state and federal levels as well. Okay. Now, let me, I'm going to come back again to this political issue. Um, the, uh, just to clarify your answer, when we, if you try to convince people that, that integration is the way to go, are you making the argument to them that their house actually will not decrease in value? Or are you making the argument that their house may decrease in value, but whatever loss in value they have to bear, it's worth it uh, for the greater good? The second. Okay. Okay. That's, that's the, so that, that, that people, that there will be a cost for integration um, in terms of the uh, home values in the previously all white, often affluent communities. Those communities will actually bear a cost, but we have to convince them that that cost is actually worth it. Yeah, it's a, uh, yes, of course. Uh, you know, the community that I described in this article, San Mateo, and I put the link to it, um, you know, those houses um, went just in the last 10 years, 15 years, from, from values of uh, $500,000, $600,000 to a million and a half. Mm -hmm. If uh, opening up the community to diverse residents reduces the value from 1.5 million to 1.3 million, uh, those families are not going to be losing anything. They're just not going to be gaining as much from the uh, opportunity to live in an exclusive neighborhood. Okay, that's okay. The, uh, say a little bit, this is, I mean, the residential segregation, this differs from some of the other uh, civil rights issues we've talked about in the past and that, you know, often we look back and we see government as the bad guy and, and doing bad stuff. The government had unequal and racially segregated schools and so forth. But here, you very well highlight the interplay between, you know, government action on the one hand and private actors on the other. So do you have thoughts? I know you do have thoughts about the, the role and the responsibilities of non-governmental actors uh, in producing and maintaining segregation. It's, I, I don't agree that it's different now. You know, when we segregated lunch counters, uh, the owners of the restaurants collaborated in this policy. Uh, it's not as though this was a government only that was creating a, a segregation in, in uh, the South and in private institutions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think that the banks, the real estate agencies, the um, uh, developers who, who succumbed to federal policy willingly, maybe even uh, take aggressively uh, promoting it, who succumbed to this policy, have a, also have a responsibility to take part in remedying it. What, what, what should we expect private uh, organizations to do, or what should we be calling on them to do? You, you, you mentioned some of those in, your, in, your, uh, in the New York Times article. Yeah, I think, they, I think they should, we should be creating um, funds with uh, substantial contributions from the fri private industries, uh, private businesses that uh, participate in the creation of the segregation. They should be asked to contribute substantially to funds to subsidize, for example, African-Americans uh, to move to communities from which they've previously been excluded. That's one uh, idea that I talked about in that article. Wow. Okay, this is... Um... How about, so we have a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of pushback on the, 
idea of asking individuals to bear the cost of uh, wrongdoing that they were not individually responsible for. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, and you, um, could you say a little bit more about Minneapolis and, and what the result has been there? So they eliminated a large percentage of single family zoning? Well, has how has that been, played out? It hasn't really been implemented yet. It's fairly recent, so there's, there's no play out yet. But let me respond to this uh, thing you just said about uh, people taking responsibility for remedying things that they didn't create. Uh, I was once on a panel, I'll tell you this story, I wrote about this in the book, um, with Sherilyn Eiffel, who was the president and director of counsel of the NACP Legal Defense Fund. And we gave a presentation and afterwards somebody in the audience got up and said exactly what you said. Why should I have to uh, make sacrifices to fix something that I didn't create, my family didn't create? Uh, I'm, my parents only moved here, you know, uh, to this country two generations ago. They didn't have anything to do with this. And Sherilyn Eiffel uh, looked at this uh, question and said, well, you eat hot dogs on the 4th of July, don't you? And I thought it was the most, one of the most brilliant comments I've ever heard because what she was saying was that when we become American citizens, we, have, we accept the privileges of American citizenship, even though our ancestors didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. It's part of the consequences of being a citizen of this country. And if we accept the privileges of citizenship, we also have to accept the responsibilities of citizenship. And one of those responsibilities is to remedy the civil rights violations that our government has created. And that's a, a responsibility that all of us have if we take our citizen responsi citizenship responsibility seriously. That's persuasive to me. I don't know if it's persuasive to everyone else, but because uh, we have such entrenched, I mean, one of the problems I think you highlight, we just have such entrenched interest here, right? Because you know, you're, you're obviously correct about the, the segregated water fountains and, you know, there were already enough water fountains for everyone and no one really has to give up anything. Uh, but here you have decades of reliance on racist policy that has been used to construct the residential patterns of the nation. And even as people might recognize that the policy is racist in its intent and in its consequences, uh, they don't want to give up what they've got. So, but we so enact policies. We enact policies all the time that ask people to give up what they got uh, in the pursuit of social good. We change our tax policies to be more progressive or less progressive. Uh, when we change them to be more progressive, people are giving up what they had previously. Uh, we can do that if we are convinced that the, the policy goals are necessary. Right. Well, well, there we're, we're I mean, those policies are never retroactive, though, right? They're always going forward, right? So income in the future is going to be taxed at a higher or lower rate. Whereas here, when people have equity in their home, they feel like that's, that's money they've made. Uh, well, they may feel that way, but this is not a retroactive policy. We're not uh, on, uh, rewriting the sales of previous homes in that community. We're making a, a policy of going forward. It's no different. I don't see any difference between that and, and changing the tax policy. Okay. And what about, can you say something about, I mean, this, this segues into uh, issues of reparations, which have been, you know, much debated uh, as of late. I and mean, there was, this was an issue in the uh, Democratic presidential primaries uh, and has been debated since then uh, in, the, in the Twitter sphere or whatever, you know, in social media. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how to approach and think about the issue of reparations generally? Yeah, I think it's a, a, not a helpful term. Uh, people think of it as making a single monetary payment to the current generation. That won't solve this. Um, what we need are policies, some of which would be require the expenditure of public funds, like the subsidies I was talking about, but many of them cost nothing to the public treasury. It costs nothing to um, uh, abolish single family zoning, for example. There are many policies we should follow to redress segregation that are cost free and many that would be costly. Uh, so focusing simply on a monetary payment, uh, I think is uh, misleads us into how to fix this problem. Okay, but I, but I do think you, I'm, I'm assuming you do think it would be useful to have an inquiry into our past, which is what most of the, 
federal reparations legislation has called for. Well, that's why I wrote the book. That's okay. So, I hope it's useful. <laughs> okay, we hope so. No, I think this has been, I'm, I should, let me just add a, a personal note here. So I have a, have a, a book club. It's a great group of guys. And we just talked about your book um, day before yesterday. And for everyone, it was a revelation. These are people who grew up in different parts of the country. Uh, everyone learned something new. Uh, we even had someone join us who had been head of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, you know, a housing agency. Uh, and he gave his perspective. And, you know, something that everybody could connect to. Everybody thought the book was a revelation. Uh, and it gave them a different lens uh, with which to, to see the history and even to see the present. So uh, it's, it's a useful and important project. So I'm, I'm delighted that, that you wrote it. Thank you. Okay, the, um, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, what could you talk somewhat about um, uh, current policies about access to capital? Uh, we have a number of questions uh, wanting to know how access to capital and loans and resources figures in to, or fits in. Uh, to the access to housing issue? Well, let me be brief. We, once you establish a pattern of segregation, as we have, race-neutral policies, as I said before, can um, disparately impact uh, the, the victims of those policies and reinforce segregation. So as far as access to capital goes, here's one simple example. Uh, our credit system, uh, banks uh, give credit they have credit scores, as you know, and when evaluating applications by, by uh, buyers for, for mortgages, they look at their credit scores. You get a good credit score, a higher credit score, if, if you've owned a home in the past and you've paid your, made your mortgage payments on time. It is not counted towards your credit score if you've been a renter and have paid your rent payments on time. Now, that's not a racial policy. Nobody says that we're going to come up with a credit scoring system that uh, is targeted at African Americans, but it has a disparate impact and it affects their access to mortgages and, and uh, in that sense, to, to capital. And how about, you know, we, we uh, have a ballot measure uh, coming up uh, regarding Prop 13, uh, which is shape, uh, you know, many things in California. Uh, do you have a view on that, on Prop 13? And well, um, I don't. Uh, I don't take positions on legislation in particular states. Uh, I'm trying to, but uh, I'll tell you some general principles. General principles. First of all, uh, I think that it's reasonable uh, to freeze property taxes for existing homeowners. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the causes of displacement under gentrification in other places that the minority of African-American or Latino uh, homeowners who've paid off their homes can no longer afford to live in them because the property taxes go up. So I think it's uh, because as, as the community gentrifies and values increase. So I think it's reasonable to freeze property taxes for existing homeowners. It's also reasonable not to extend the same freeze policy towards commercial property. And finally, I think that uh, it's not reasonable uh, to avoid collecting the lost property taxes from homeowners who've had their property taxes frozen at point of sale. So if you have a, uh, a, a homeowner in a property freeze uh, system, who, for example, may have bought his or her home for $100,000 uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and then sells it for a million dollars, but has paid property taxes under a property freeze regime in the intervening years at the $100,000 rate, when that home is sold for a million dollars, the lost property taxes at that point get returned to the treasury. So you don't have the adverse effect that we have in some state, in, in a, one state I'm thinking of in particular, where you starve schools and, and libraries and other public facilities because the money gets returned to the treasury. And the homeowner, instead of making a $900,000 capital gain at point of sale, maybe only makes a $750,000 capital gain. So that's uh, how I would approach the property tax issue. That's an interesting idea. So you would collect the property taxes later at the point of sale. Yes. Uh, so they're not waived, they're just collected later. Okay, excellent idea. So one of our comments, this is in all caps, is Richard Rothstein, you are not too old to make good trouble. 
Uh, <laughs> keep making good trouble. Uh, you just need people to help you make the good trouble. I think we have a lot of people on the call who are happy to help you make the good trouble. Uh, well, because I hope this, I'll hear from them. Yeah, I mean, this is a time, and just to, to underscore one of the, the points that you make in, in the book somewhat, but that you also emphasize in the comments, is that this, you know, residential segregation is not just a segregation of people. It's also a segregation of resources, a segregation of opportunities. It's a segregation of access to all the things that all of us want in our lives. Uh, and as such, it underlies lots of our other problems. Uh, you can't think, uh, imagine uh, that segregation is not relevant to the policing uh, horrible incidents that, that have occurred uh, between police officers and citizens recently. Uh, and that's an important thing to, to, to know, that it's kind of a linchpin to lots of other bad stuff uh, in our society. Okay. Um, let me see, there's still a lot of questions that we're not going to, to uh, uh, be able to reach here. Uh, how about the, um, you familiar with the accessory dwelling unit uh, legislation statewide? How, how big a difference does that make? Well, I, I, um, I'm not familiar with the California proposition, but I am familiar with accessory dwelling units. They make a very small difference because the big problem is uh, housing for families uh, and accessory dwelling units are, are usually, uh, you know, starter homes for, for uh, uh, singles or, or recently married uh, uh, couples. So anything that increases the housing supply in a place like California is a first step. But uh, in it itself is not going to do anything to uh, redress the segregation that I'm so concerned about. But it's necessary to increase the housing supply. If, if uh, some of those young professionals <clears throat> can move to accessory dwelling units, um, uh, that will take some of the pressure off housing supply elsewhere. Okay, so I, I think we're, we're nearing our end. So let me just ask you in, in closing, if we can, uh, you know, many people are, are uh, want to uh, address this issue, uh, a sense that they're unsure whether we can. So what bit of hope or inspiration uh, can you leave people with to feel that this problem that has developed over many decades and is so central to our struggles can actually be surmounted? I don't want to repeat myself. I'm very hopeful about the uh, national conversation we're having about race. It's more accurate and passionate than we ever have had before in American history. And I'm hopeful, not confident, but hopeful that it can lead to uh, a new civil rights movement that will address these issues. Yeah, one, one more. Let me just ask you one more question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think I share your, your hope, but not, uh, uh, if I read you right, maybe there's more, more hope than there is optimism at the, or, or, or confidence. confidence more, yeah. There's no, more I'm, hope I'm than there's confidence. I'm just not confident. But what, what do you think, how should this, this new civil rights movement, uh, well, let me, let me back up to frame it in, in your history. You know, we've had you know, two great eras where we've tried to really make progress as a, as a nation with respect to racial injustice, right? One was the reconstruction after the end of slavery. And then one was the civil rights movement, kind of a second reconstruction after the end of de jure segregation, sort of on the book segregation um, and supporting that. Now we're at a, a time where people are mostly focusing on criminal justice and mass incarceration and policing. Uh, and then the question arises whether this is a time for a third reconstruction. And those earlier reconstructions by definition, they didn't accomplish all we needed them to accomplish because he, here we are again. And so then the question arises, what should, the, what should protesters, activists, m the movement, uh, what should people be doing differently now than in the 60s or even if you want to go back to the 19th century during Reconstruction? Well, it's a different period. It's a different time and, every, and things are going to be different. And, you know, I can't uh, give you a, a roadmap uh, any more than, uh, as I said uh, earlier, than the Civil Rights Movement could have given you a roadmap in the 1950s okay. about what the 1960s were going to look like. 
<laughs> but do you, do you think something that every one of uh, I did suggest something that every one of you can do now, and that is to challenge the way this history is taught in your schools. But beyond that, you need to create local groups that are biracial, that are multi-ethnic, and that can begin to figure out how this can be uh, addressed in your local community. Uh, I have lots of ideas about uh, policies, as I say, uh, but I can't uh, predict exactly how local civil rights groups are going to implement those ideas. Okay. Is, is the Black Lives Matter movement, is, is that a model or no? No, it's not a model, but it has created an awareness uh, that is, uh, can be the foundation for further reflection and action uh, on these issues. I don't think that the, it's a model for taking further action. It, it's focused, uh, it was, it's been provoked, as you know, by uh, the killings of uh, young African-American men by police. Uh, it's not a model for uh, redressing residential segregation, but it does call attention to the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, which I think is undeniable. Uh, we have much more accurate understanding of it. You see references to it everywhere. As you said, there's even talk unheard of uh, in uh, political campaigns about reparations. So it's created the foundations, the precondition for a civil rights movement. Uh, it's not a model for the civil rights movement itself. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Mark, I think this is, we're a few minutes over our time. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me reiterate uh, what I said at the beginning, which is that everyone should read this book. Uh, if you don't have it, you should buy it and you should buy one for a friend. Uh, wherever they live, they'll probably find something about the part of the nation where they live, uh, which will bring the story to life uh, and let them know that although the title is The Color of Law, um, this book is even more or even or as much about the people uh, whose lives have been shaped by the law. So uh, thank you. Richard Rothstein, um, this is a wonderful uh, conversation, uh, which I hope we can do again.